Good morning, everybody. Hi. This morning, we welcome in Isaiah, Med Isaiah Medina, Chief Photojournalist at KDVR in Denver, Colorado. Isaiah leads a team of incredibly talented visual storytellers. Uh, Denver has long been for decades a hotbed of visual storytelling, award-winning uh, stories and storytellers, Emmy Award winners, Murrow Award winners, um, and NPPA Award winners. And um, Isaiah's team there is just a, a standout, standout crew of uh, just great visual storyteller. So to, to have him aboard for this morning is just so exciting. Isaiah, welcome in, and we appreciate Thanks you Thanks for having service. me. Yeah, so uh, Isaiah is going to drive the presentation, right? So I will, uh, I will give him control of this. Uh, let's see. I think you already that. had given me control, I believe. Oh, no, you got to give me permission to share my screen. Let's, okay, let's see. Make the host. I'm going to make Isaiah the host right now. Boom. I think you should have it now, yep. Isaiah. So we're so glad to have you and uh, wel welcome in. And uh, we are excited about your presentation. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, hold on, let's see. Let me stop sharing this real quick. All right, that works. Thanks for having me. Though, for those of you that don't know me, I am uh, Isaiah Medina. I am the chief photojournalist here at Fox 31 in Denver. I've been doing that for about the past year and a half. I have about 18 years of experience in this business. So I've been around for quite a bit, but uh, I just, I appreciate you guys uh, letting me join you and, and hopefully you can, I can give you some advice that uh, will help you throughout your careers. Um, to start, I would like to just know a little bit about everybody. Maybe you go around and introduce yourselves and, and tell me what you wanna do in TV. Uh, great. Uh, I'll start on my screen. Top left, Rolanza, why don't you go first? Unmute and tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Rolanza Stitz. I am uh, from Piedmont, but I go to Jacksonville State University. I'm a senior. And uh, what my dream is to go into sports entertainment broadcasting. And um, and so like I'm involved on campus, like I work at like the, like I worked at the radio station, video editing and like promoting uh, shows and stuff. And so that's what I, what I want to do basically. Right on, okay. Who else? Super, Yara, Yara, what about you? Hi, my name is Yara Troche. I'm a senior at Florida International University and a post I think to a lot of my fellow internships, uh, interns. I don't want to do hard news. I would actually would want to do more on the entertainment reporting side. Okay. Hey, Hannah, how about you? Hey, I'm Hannah, and I am a senior studying through Southern Adventist University, but I'm in Italy right now studying abroad, and I'll be done in May. Um, I do want to be a reporter. I love local news because it's highly personal, and I like how it connects people. And someday I would like to do international news because I love to travel, and I speak Italian, and I'd love to do stories here. All right. Carly, how about you? Wade, I am the University of Montevallo in Alabama. I am a senior. Um, I would like to become an anchor of some kind, um, whether it be like just like news and then I would either, either just regular news or like anything with sports, like a sports reporter or something. And I, I'm also into like videography. So like sports videography would be cool too. Nice. Ryan, how about you? You got it. What's going on, y'all? I'm Ryan Arbogast. I'm a senior at Syracuse. I want to be an MMJ locally, but I want to move down south to start because the cold has been killing me for years. And I also study political science. So I want to, at some point, do some sort of political reporting. I'd like to put those two together at some point. Even if that doesn't necessarily mean Washington, I'd like to cover a big city's government, whatever that case may be. Thanks. Jared, how about you, sir? Um, I'm Jared Donald. I'm a junior at the University of North Alabama. I'm actually a film major, um, a videographer, as well as an editor. And I know for a fact that I don't really want to go into the cinematic uh, department. So I'm, I'm figuring out what else I can do, you know, videography-wise and editing-wise. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of just playing around with other possible jobs. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Grace, how about you? 
Hey, Mr. Medina. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Grace Cockrell. I'm a senior at Jacksonville State University, and I'm aspiring to actually be a photojournalist. So I'm very excited that you're here. Um, I have been shooting for Jacksonville State for four years, um, doing university advancement, doing a lot of creative content, everything from you, everything from like interviews, student life events, athletics, you name it, we do it. Um, I love it. My goal is to basically just be a traveling photographer and really go out and capture the raw reality that is in our world. No sugarcoating. These are the images that you see um, and present that to the world so they can get a better picture of the truth. So that's me. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Kimberly, how about you, ma'am? Oh, well, I'm a senior here at the University of West Georgia. And um, I guess my thing will just be anywhere that I get accepted, you know, living in Metro Atlanta, the competition is pretty hard. So just anywhere where I get accepted. <laughs> I appreciate it. Samantha, how about you, ma'am? Hello, my name is Samantha. I apologize for my video not being on. I'm having technical difficulties and I'm not very technologically advanced, so I'm very sorry. Um, but I'm a junior at Auburn. I'm studying public relations and journalism. And I would like to work, I think, with a bigger network, either on their public relations side or as a correspondent. I have a really big passion for entertainment and news. Here in college, I've been pretty involved in Eagle Eye TV, and I've been able to get experience in both news and entertainment. I co-host an entertainment talk show with a friend of mine, and it's been a very good time. So I would like to continue to do that after graduation. Thank you, Samantha. And uh, Isaiah, we also have myself and uh, Justin Barr on the video call here. We're doing a unique thing this semester, which was pretty exciting, where um, I'm teaching the, the uh, two two days a week for the course, but we're actually doing it with interns from both WRBL and WHNT in Huntsville. So Justin, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Justin Barr. I am the morning executive producer at WHNT in Huntsville. Uh, and th this is just a joke. I'll flip it around. Uh, I want to be a college student. Can I, can I be a college student? <laughs> uh, all kidding aside though, uh, you know, just great working with this group. And I, I think you're going to find a lot of great questions here in the next hour. That's great. And of course, I'm Gene Kirkall. I'm the news director at WRBL. And Isaiah got my start as a photojournalist at WEAR in Pensacola, Florida, and was very fortunate to be in a newsroom where my chief photographer, Bill Evans, who now uh, runs a photo team at WLOX and in, uh, in uh, Win rather uh, Asheville, North Carolina, uh, was very much into NPPA and turned me on to that. And I went to the workshop a couple of times and really uh, got excited about visual storytelling. And really that that love of visuals and the craft of NPPA style propelled my entire career. And so I'm just so excited to have you on board here and looking forward to your presentation. I appreciate everyone uh, having me and thank you, Gene, for, for doing this. I admire that you're still uh, teaching in, during a pandemic. You know, it hasn't been easy for sure. Yes. Um, how much of you guys know about MPPA? Have you guys heard about it? Have you guys looked into it? For those of you that are reporters and, and want to be photojournalists, I highly recommend it. You know, they always, if you go to their conference, it's, it's once every year, it's about a week long conference and they always say it changes your life. And literally it does. I never expected to be in this position. Um, it was a dream to be in Denver. You know, I never thought I would be here, but because I went to MPPA and learned how to be a storyteller, um, it's what propelled me into another level. Um, so throughout this next hour, I'm going to show you a bunch of pieces um, that I've done, but also this next one, I'm going to show you a story that really inspired me. And it's from a photojournalist named Scott Jensen. Um, and so some of these are pretty long, so please bear with me. Um, I, I do have an investigative background. You know, I, I did uh, general assignment news for about two years here, and then I jumped into the I-team and that, that put me into a whole nother level. But, you know, all of these pieces have a story behind them. Just like you guys, all of you have a story. Um, and I'll tell you, this business is not for the weak. You gotta have some thick skin to be in this business but it's also the most gratifying business. Um, you know, I enjoy coming to work every day. 
every day is something different. And I'll tell you the doors that this career has opened for me has been incredible. You know, I've been able to go to the ins, uh, NFL NSC championship game, you know, and be on the sideline when Richard Sherman caught that interception from Colin Kaepernick in, the, in, in Seattle. I was on the sideline. That happened right in front of me. You know, I was, I've been able to go to Hawaii. I've been able to travel and see this world. So, you know, there's going to be times where, where, you know, you're going to be thinking, okay, what am I doing with my life? But I'll tell you, there's a lot better, more, there's more uh, better times uh, that will just help you realize like you're doing something good in this world and, and you're making a difference. You know, a big reason why I am a journalist, um, I want to, I like to hold the powerful accountable. You know, I like to give people a voice and it does make me feel like I am making a difference in this world. So some of these stories, you know, you'll see how how everything has um, just pretty much come together in my career. And I, I think you might be shocked with with my backstory, which I'll share at the very end. But I'm going to show you a lot of these pieces. Um, but before I do the first one, let's let's let me see Gage, where were you guys in storytelling? What makes a good story? Not everybody at once. Anybody can unmute and speak. I think um, I think a good story, what makes a good story is something that completely captivates you from the get-go um, and really holds that attention um, and makes somebody crave more of the information. And it's not a drag. It doesn't seem like a chore to continue to read and to look into. And then after yeah. reading, look more into from other sources. So that's what I would define as a good story. Okay. What are some of the elements that you need for a good story? I'd say the biggest thing for me would always be the newsworthiness of it, the importance, the impact. You know, how is this going to affect my everyone that's watching in my audience? And that doesn't necessarily mean controversy or conflict. It could mean a lot of different things, but how is this going to impact the people that are watching behind the TV? Yeah. Who else? Like you said, elements wise, I think the elements of a good story is something that's very thorough, is very clear, um, is concise with being clear, um, but also has enough information and without being boring and has enough like, I don't know, tone to it to make it captivating. So just something thorough, but unique in a way. It's kind of, I know it's people when they think of news, it's always this boring hard fact whatever if you anybody that's outside of what all of us do you know that's what they're going to think but something that has enough tone to it um yeah. to be able to convey this information in a way that real is that grip and is that thorough and concise while still being interesting so. yeah well some of the things that i i have learned that makes a great story is bottom line you got to get both sides to the story everybody has a side whether it's the good person the bad person doesn't matter there's two sides and as long as you tell both of those sides you'll be okay you know emotion emotion is what carries stories um you know you can have the worst editing the worst videography whatever but if you have some emotion in there doesn't matter because that draws people's attention characters if you have a character, you know, uh, let's say a one-legged dog with a one-arm owner, I mean, somebody who's crazy, you know, just a real good character, that's going to carry a story. Um, getting good sound, you know, you got to think about getting natural sound. Think about, you know, the way I see life when I started shooting is everything is a sequence. So from you guys picking up your pen to start writing notes, to looking at me, to looking at the screen, I'm constantly thinking about how I'm going to tell that story. Um, and just capturing moments. Capturing moments is the most difficult thing to do if you're shooting because there is no stop and start. <laughs> you know, I can't tell you how many moments that I have missed in my life um, that, that I was like, oh, it was right there, you know? And so, you know, you have to learn all of these skills in order to become a storyteller. And it's, you know, it's going to take time. I'm going to tell you that it's going to take you a long time. And 
I am constantly learning something different every day. It doesn't matter, but I have had a lot of mentors throughout my career to where I've listened to everyone and taken their advice, look at stories constantly and really have given everything into my career to become one of the best, you know? So with that said, you know, I, I remember being, you know, this, uh, I started in TV in New Mexico and uh, I went to MPPA after shooting for about three years um, and it literally changed my life. You know, one of the stories that inspired me was this story by Scott Jensen that I'm gonna share with you right now. Let me know if you guys can't hear this. I'm just playing. Whoops. Can you guys hear that? Yes. Kayla. Hey, Emma. Hey, Nathaniel. At Alpenglow Elementary, it's another day of bundling up. Hey, Wylan, you still want to be principal? All right, let's go. Cool. Even the freezing weather doesn't stop the kids at this Eagle River school from playing hard. I am so sorry. I didn't, you guys could not hear, see that, could you? There you go. Hi, Michaela. Hey, Emma. Hey, Nathaniel. At Alpen Glow Elementary, it's another day of bundling up. Hey, Wyland, you still want to be principal? All right, let's go. Cool. Even the freezing weather doesn't stop the kids at this Eagle River school from playing hard. But one student is missing. How many animals, animals does he have? How many animals does he have? Nine-year-old Sean Stockwell left Alaska for California almost two years ago. You have to circle a number. Which number is it? 30. His school is now a room in the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford University. Which one is it? Seven. Seven. His home is the Ronald McDonald House. You know, he's so pale and he's so blue. There's always that question, is he going to live to see his new heart? So you can see how dramatically smaller that portion of the heart is. Sean needs a heart transplant. Born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, <laughs> only half of his heart is fully developed. He downplays the seriousness of it all. How is he feeling? Good. Any changes in his life? No. What does he want to do? Go home. Why do you want to go home? I don't know. What do you miss about home? Four Miller. <laughs> For close to two agonizing years, Sean and his mother Trista have been waiting for a donor heart. <laughs> Trying to make the most of their time away. He's just the sweetest kid. He's um, more concerned about other kids in the house than he is about even himself. He's just, um, he makes it fun. He's so fun. Oh, yeah? Yeah. At the Ronald McDonald house, Sean plays with his sisters and other kids receiving medical treatment. But what about his friends back home from Alpine Glow Elementary? We took our camera to the school so they can send Sean a message. Hi, Sean. It's me, Brandon, here without the glasses. Hi. Kids who knew Sean in first grade. They're third graders now. I haven't seen you in ages. Who are you? When you come back to Alaska, I really want to say hi because I really miss you. We played the greetings for the Stockwells. <laughs> I miss you, Sean. <laughs> I remember your blonde hair. <laughs> I'm just playing video games with you at your house. We hope you get your heart really fast, and um, we hope you can get back here so we can be in the same class again. Uh, we miss you a lot. When are you going to get back to Alaska? We're going to um, go snowshoeing next oh, Tuesday. Don't run that fast. <laughs> And eat healthy and eat your vegetables. <laughs> this is a family that loves to laugh. Let me dip you and kiss you. <laughs> but the laughter is harder to come by these days. You see that clubbing on his fingers? Sean's condition is worsening. 
His fingertips are swollen, showing signs of poor circulation. His skin is pale and lips display a purple hue. Each night, Sean fights the symptoms with five different medications. Post-transplant, he'll be on about 28 meds. And while they've waited. Isn't that impressive? He makes it so easy. They've seen several kids come to this hospital that works miracles, get a new heart, and go home. Can you have a new one heart? The latest heart recipient is five-year-old Adeline Williams from Kansas. A week and a half since her transplant, she's out of intensive care and already downing the crunch berries. Her cheeks swollen from the steroids to control her blood pressure. It's an emotional roller coaster that you're on because you're so happy and you're so sad for the other family because we thought we were going to be in that place. But while parents Becky and Caleb are thrilled with Addie's gift of life, it doesn't erase a sense of guilt. Her heart came after a mere two months and Sean's still waiting. I wanted Sean to have this heart so, so bad because being away from home, it is so hard. It's a bit much. So, I mean, I know I'll get through it, but sometimes I just don't see how. Because I'm scared. <laughs> Come on, run to mommy, run to mommy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mommy will protect you. Trista says she became close to many families staying at the Ronald McDonald house, but so many received treatment and went home while they still wait. She now keeps to herself most of the time. I was just hurting so badly. It was like I couldn't share with anybody. And it was like I was carrying around this, this load that was just too much. And so it was just, it was just easier for me to just, um, lock myself away and I have been because I don't want to talk. I mean, what am I going to talk about? The fact that I'm homesick. It's a little much for a nine-year-old mind to handle sometimes. What did I make you cry this time about? <laughs> Is it because I started crying? Do you know I wouldn't be anywhere else in the whole world? A call could come at any time, so the Stockwells are forced to stay within two hours of the hospital. Well, tell me what's wrong. They visited places like San Francisco several times. You want to go home? But it's not Eagle River. I miss you. His friends want him to come home too. Um, I hope you get a heart soon. So what did that story have wow. there? Emotion. <laughs> right. Characters. The kids made that story. I mean, it has everything. I'm telling you, that story inspired me. And to this day, it still makes me cry. <laughs> you know, it, it really told me something that I want to be able to do that for somebody someday. And that's why I do this career. Um, you know, I'll tell you, when I came to Denver, and police use some Oops. of that uh, non-lethal artillery on this. Saturday night. When I came to Denver, I had a reporter um, ask me, why did you come to Denver? And with a straight face, I told her, well, because I want to learn from the best. And she looked at me and she laughed at me. And I was like, wow, like, you know, I couldn't believe somebody would actually not understand why I wanted to come to Denver, but she had been here for a long time, you know? And that just little things like that motivate you throughout your career. Um, and it just inspires you. And that's why I, I hope that my story will inspire you at some point, you know, to get you to keep you guys going um, and keep you guys doing what you want to do, which is uh, journalism. You know, it's, I have a passion for it. So and I can see that each of you guys are are really into it, too. So um, this next story is one of the first stories I have ever done. Um, when I first got here after hearing, you know, you know, someone laugh at you uh, because you want to work with the best. So, you know, this story is not is not one of my greatest stories, but it was the first story where I realized um, I can do this. I can I can be work I can work with some of the best and hold my own. On Saturday night after protesters became combative, this one public works crews tried to collect the tents and shelters they had set up. Channel 2 photojournalist Isaiah Medina takes us inside the chaos. I saw 
the police. I'm brutal for no reason. I saw them charge a guy. I saw them choke a guy. I saw people get two guests. I saw people get Unfortunately, at a certain point, they went up onto the state capitol grounds in an area that they were told to evacuate. They chose not to do that. And we're not going away. Things escalated from there. Some of the members of the group chose to take some violent action. I saw perfectly peaceful people get pushed down by the police and sprayed and tear gas. We did use what we call less lethal force options. You don't need to post there. You only have to say it one time. Um, some of our officers started to take those tents down and then were attacked by the protesters. The violence that I saw today did not need to happen. We made a total of 20 arrests. There were fighting for. Now we're dispersing. This is not the way it's supposed to be. Because it's not illegal for them to be in the park. It, this is way bigger than us. It's only illegal for them to have this is the global movement. Uh, structures in the park. This is the beginning of the revolution. Again, that was Isaiah Medina, one of our photo journalists. So that was one of the first stories I did here. I did that by myself. You know, um, I stayed late after we shot that. You know, we had to go live and do our regular story. But I stayed late to edit that for the morning show. Why? Because I wanted to be the best. You know, I wanted to do this. And I wasn't going to be able to do it um, while we were out there. So because, I mean, that stuff takes time. But those are little things that you can do to better yourselves, to get ahead. You know, it's little advice like that, that that's gotten me to this point. You know, that story wasn't pretty. That story was a lot of off the shoulder stuff like that. But I learned from it. You know, it was the first story where people saw it and they're like, oh, who's Isaiah? You know, and, and that helped get me to this point. So um, what you guys think? I love it. Um, with I have a big passion for like the Black Lives Matter movement and shooting those protests um, was it was a really personal thing for me and seeing that kind of like how you shot that and told like told that story was really inspiring and it really hits close to home. Um, and I, I thought it was great. I liked how the sequence and how everything matched up really well and was cohesive, but also like was unique in that way. Um, but I like that. That was really great. Really, really great. Yeah, I would just say you just didn't try. I just, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you oh, off. Go ahead, the go Zoom ahead. stuff is not always yeah. the easiest, but all I was going to say was I thought it was really well done that you were able to tell a complete story without adding your voice whatsoever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, this, um, I'll tell you right now during this pandemic, it's probably the biggest story that I'll ever cover throughout my career. It's also been the hardest. Um, with all the protests and stuff like that, I'll tell you, nothing could prepare you for that. As a journalist, um, things are constantly changing, but nothing could have prepared me to, to handle what I've seen and done in, in some of these protests. You know, I'll tell you a story. Um, one of the first nights we started having protests here in Denver um, for the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, we, it was a Saturday night. We've already had two nights of protest. And uh, I get a phone call that three of my guys are trapped by um, people attacking them with rocks and stuff. And I literally had to rush out there, pick them up. And as we were getting bombarded with rocks and we had to escape like all these trash cans on fire, rocks being thrown at us and have these guys um, you know, pretty much five guys in my car with all their cameras, everything in our in in there, and um, it was really eye opening to me because if I hadn't been out there, who knows what would have happened to them, um, and nothing could have prepared me for that. Um, we we ended up losing two cars, two news units over it, um, which the bosses weren't happy about, but we were all safe. You know, nothing is ever going to prepare you for things like that. Um, you know, through this pandemic, we've had to adapt. Uh, 
I tell you, I'll, I'll tell you, learn technology, learn as much as you can. Zoom is the easiest thing you'll be able to learn because I can't tell you how much stuff I've, I've had to learn um, that is not part of my job description. You know, I've spent half the year just building studios for, for anchors and reporters at their homes, which is not an easy task, especially when you're dealing with uh, people's home internet. <laughs> so um, learn everything you can. A um, couple of things I've learned is always make friend with, friends with the assignment desk because they decide your fate every day. That was the first thing I learned when I got here. Um, it could be a decision from you out covering snow or you covering a nice feature story. So <laughs> make friends with the assignment desk. Second is make friends with an engineer because when something breaks, uh, let's say a microphone, your camera, what, what, what whatever, um, you need to get that fixed in a timely manner. Well, engineers sometimes cannot be uh, as efficient as you want them to be. So make friends with engineers and just be nice to people. Um, you know, a smile will bring you a long way. Um, you'll be able to, you, you'll, be, you'll realize that just having a good attitude and, and putting a smile on your face will get you those stories eventually that will, um, what I call feed your soul, that, that just make you feel good stories that, that are just going to propel you in your career. So those are the three things that I've, I've taken um, to heart as I've grown as a photojournalist, and I think it's really helped. Um, this next story, I'll tell you the, what, what happened afterwards, but this next story I, uh, it was one of the first bis big investigations that I had um, here. And I was really proud of it because, you know, we made it into a half hour special. But I remember after it aired, the news director pulled me into her office, me and the reporter and said the production value wasn't up to standards. And I was just shocked because we just had put our heart and soul into this story. You know, and that day it taught me um, one thing is that everybody has an opinion and never forget that. No matter what I my opinion is or anybody else's, everybody has an opinion. But don't, never let that take that to heart. Um, don't take it personal because it's going to be throughout your career. You're going to constantly be facing that. Powerful drug developed to treat pain after surgery is also being used to get injured college football players back on the field. Come game time, these guys are looking for any edge they can get. And at universities like Colorado. I'm sure we injected some. And Colorado State. We won't use total. We did last year quite a bit. Coaches and trainers can't run from the truth. You either tape it, brace it, and shoot it, or you go home. Right now, an exclusive Fox 31 Problem Solvers investigation masking the pain. That is where we start tonight for Colorado's top university sports programs. Toradol is just one drug in an arsenal of numbing agents and painkillers given to student athletes. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Jeremy Hubbard. And I'm Deborah Takahara. Fox 31 Denver's Problem Solvers spent months fighting with 10 state universities to find out what kind of medications they supply in the training room. Investigative reporter Chris Halsey has the exclusive results. This stockpile of vials and syringes represent the number of Toradol injections that a single Colorado university purchased during just one football season. Some injured football players consider it a magic potion that helps them play through the pain. Others consider it a dangerous snake oil. Dad, quiet! It's only 5.30 in the morning. Move, 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 dig! And already former Bronco and Colorado Buffalo lineman Matt McChesney's voice is getting hoarse. At his gym 6-0, it's tough love as he trains some of this state's best high school football players for the rigors of big time college sport. Faster! He preaches physical. Pick it up or he's gonna keep running. And mental toughness. Don't worry, we can do this all day. Nope. And refuses to shy away from telling the truth 
about the ugly expectation of playing through injuries. You better find a way to take care of yourself. Because if you don't, you're just going to be all broke down cripple. With the Broncos, Jets, Dolphins, and while at the University of Colorado in 2003, McChesney says he was shot up with Toradol, or its generic equivalent, Ketorolac, at least 100 times, shortening his career. Get a shot in your butt cheek before a game. You feel like freaking Superman when you walk on the field. Everything's numb. You feel great. After the game, when you wake up the next day, you feel like you got hit like a Mack truck because it hides everything. So what do you do? You go get another shot. Based on our extensive review of thousands of painkiller prescription invoices from CU, Colorado State, and Northern Colorado, McChesney's young prospects will likely be offered similar help with their pain when they get to college. In 2014, Colorado State Athletics ordered 25 vials of Ketorolac three times, including an overnight shipment the day the Rams played the Utah State Aggies in October. For months, CSU refused to answer our questions about game day Toradol use and its distribution of narcotics to players. So we headed to the Rams spring football scrimmage. You'll bring him back, promise? Media relations staff physically escorted players away from our cameras and prevented new athletic director Joe Parker from speaking to us about painkillers. However, that interference didn't protect first-year head football coach Mike Bobo. What are your thoughts on the use of Toradol to get injured players back on the field quicker here at the CSU? Yeah, I, you had to ask our team doctors about that. They handled that, and we don't use Toradol. <laughs> now, they did last year quite a bit, about 75 vials. Do you have your own philosophy on it? I, I trust the doctor's judgment on things. Although Coach Bobo was upset with our questions, his program isn't the only one buying up pain-killing medications. During the 2013 football season, Northern Colorado administered Toradol to 12 athletes participating in football who received a combined total of 29 injections. The Bears' written policy regarding the use of Toradol or Ketorolac says for optimal results, injections should be given one hour prior to the start of the competition. From 2011 to 2014, the University of Colorado in Boulder ordered 56 vials and 999 tablets of Ketorolac. That along with thousands of injections of numbing agents like lidocaine and bupivacaine. The players can't make that decision. We have to help guide them. Dr. Eric McCarty is team physician. He defends the program's use of painkillers and anti-inflammatories, while at the same time admitting there is a growing concern and controversy over Toradol's use. Ever since I've been here at uh, Colorado, we've never really used it that much. Sure, we injected some, but not that much. Whereas I've seen a lot of programs that have really utilized it and injected people, sometimes a dozen players a game. Like at the University of Southern California, former star Armand Armstead recently settled a landmark civil case saying repeated Toradol injections sent him into cardiac arrest. And the NFL has also been sued by players claiming Toradol worsens concussions. Floats one out on the right flat. Nate Jackson has it. Former Denver Bronco tight end Nate Jackson knows all about playing while injured. Juggled by Jackson as he got belted. In his book, Slow Getting Up, Jackson wrote about the dangers of the widespread use of pharmaceuticals in NFL locker rooms. Do you remember the first time you saw Toradol? At one point, I looked up and I needed it, and I was taking it every week. I don't remember the first time I had it. I don't remember the first time I saw it. It was just one more thing because guys are constantly getting pumped full of other pills. Jackson says Toradol was a mainstay for most players, and it worked so well that major college sports programs started taking notice. It's just a product of this NFL mentality just trickling down, and it's going to college, and pretty soon you're going to see Toradol in high school, and pretty soon you're going to see Toradol in Pop Warner. Faster, harder, let's go! For Matt McChesney, that's a sickening notion. You either tape it, brace it, and shoot it, or you go home. That needs to change before more of these young athletes' careers are destroyed. A spoke. So I get pulled into the boss's office on that story. You know, and they, she tells me the production value wasn't up to our standards. We ended up winning five national awards on that story including best documentary in MPPA, which is one of the toughest uh, awards you can win because the MPPA is, is the top of the top, you know, the, and it's, it's photography. So 
that tells you everybody has an opinion. Always remember that. <laughs> you guys have any questions? Um, I don't necessarily have a question, but I just want to say that story was good, like amazing. I love that one because it's like you, it's like you separate in like different sections. You have the intense coach that is crazy. He looks like he's insane. And you have like the intense, um, how these football players in high school are going through these challenges of trying to be the best football player in high school. Then you have like the coach's opinion. Then you have um, the doctor's opinion. And then you, uh, you know, got an interview with one of the professional football players and how the dangers of it all. So I'm I, like, it's really interesting to see how everything was like built up into like this one big story. And that it was really good. I like that one. Thank you. Um, so I just want to, I have a question about this. So in the story, it's mentioned that the coaches were not happy with y'all's questions. Um, so what do you do as a photojournalist? Cause I'm sure like in my career and like, of course, in your career, like, this is something that you're 100% guaranteed to run into. How do you handle that when you're like, you have to get the story, you have to have footage, you have to have photos of this to support the story. And this is a big chunk of it. Like we have to have that response. How do you deal with people and like this? the actual inside controversy, not even with the story, it's between the tension between you and the people that you're trying to get information from. How do you deal with that? You just, I'm telling you, it's it, nowadays it's, it's a totally different beast um, because nowadays people hate journalists. And you, you'll, right now, journalists have a big target on their back um, because of everything that's been going on. Yeah. Um, so it, in that time, you know, it's a lot easier. You, you just have to let it ro roll off your skin. You can't take anything personal. Yeah. Um, it is not easy. Sometimes things will, will really irk you. Um, that's one of the, you know, m more minor instances that I've been in, but investigative journalism is not for everybody. Um, it's not easy. You have to be able to, uh, make, quick decisions at a moment's notice um, and and you have to be able to just deal with a lot of stuff in the background too. I'll tell you half of these stories that I've done, there's a lot of details that we can't even air on TV. Um, and that's not easy. That's not easy to go home to um, knowing some of this stuff. Um, some So you just gotta have thick skin. That's why I say this, this job is not for the weak, you know? Um, yeah. But for, for all the bad times that you do have, you know, I'll tell you, there's going to be a lot more better, you know, um, you, you will find that out that you'll be able to do a lot of cool things uh, in the end. And you'll be like, well, if I wasn't a journalist, I wouldn't be able to be at the Super Bowl. I wouldn't be able to do this or I wouldn't have been able to, you know, think about it. You're, you're basically getting paid to tell a story, tell someone's story. Like, how cool is that? You know, yeah. most people are stuck in an office job, you know, in a cubicle, you know, crunching numbers or whatever. Like this to me is, is a dream job. So yeah. you just got to roll with it. You know, it's going to be difficult through your career, but you'll, you'll get there and you'll be able to just realize like how big of an impact you you can make. Awesome. Thank you. I think that was just like my biggest thing is like, there's always that obstacle. There's always one obstacle or like more than one obstacle, but there's guaranteed one obstacle. Like I feel like in everything that you have to overcome and it's usually just the people's response to your presence being there. Yeah. Um, they don't want to cooperate sometimes, but that's awesome. Thank you. Totally. Anybody else? Um, so actually, um, I do, I actually enjoyed both stories, but for, for different reasons. So I, I was always taught as a storyteller, you know, every scene tells a story, every shot tells a story. So, and you have two different stories and they were each told separately. So for the first one or the second one, I guess, with uh, the protest, uh, there were a lot of, you know, close-ups and quick cuts as opposed to the documentary, which was a lot of long shots and um, <clears throat> long takes. And I, I appreciate that as, I guess, as a, as a film, as a film major, I appreciate that. And it, it shows that, you know, you, you really care about trying to get your story across because there's a lot of storytellers who will just put out whatever and be like, that's good enough. 
And it's just nice to see, you know, even after doing it for, for, for so long, for a while, you haven't become, uh, I guess, jaded. So no, I think, I think, uh, I think MPPA helps you in that. And I, I would recommend that for you. Um, when, if you get the chance, you know, once you start your first gig or even if you don't, if you want to go before then, um, I really recommend it. Um, for someone like yourself who wants to be a, a photojournalist, you know, a visual storyteller, um, that's going to excel you to a whole nother level. But one thing they do teach you is that you have to know the rules before you could break them. You know, so that first story with Occupy Denver, that was dirty. There's no tripod, nothing, you know what I mean? And, you know, this, the other stories you'll see, um, there's a lot of slider movements. There's a lot of the DSLR look. You're, this is what I'm coming up to. Um, there's, you'll, I'm, you're seeing a progression of my shooting through these stories. And this next story I'm going to show you guys is a story that I think is one of those stories that I needed to feed my soul. Um, it's a story that I went out, I did it on my own time because I was so tired of doing all these sad investigative stories. And this is something that you're gonna have to find to do throughout your careers. Um, just a story that makes you feel good. So I'm gonna show you that story right now. And you'll see the difference in it. Person for the air. Whoops. This is so even in a place like Boulder, even on a street, where you might see or hear just about anything. I know. This sight. You got your own yes. This sound is bound. Whoa. To turn heads. Whoa. I know. I, I am blown away, actually. You know, she's the highlight of my day. Seeing their reactions and seeing the people just double take and try to walk away, but can't walk away. And I just, that has to make you feel good. Not too often a voice is bigger than the singer. When talent makes a liar of someone's age. But the truth is, even at 11 years old, Annalise Munoz is an old pro. And my guitar teacher would bring me to his gigs, and I got to play when I was six years old. And that's when I fell in love with the stage and fell in love with playing live in front of people. When she was about seven, um, she ended up getting her street performer's permit all on her own. I mean, we drove her there. She went through the interview on her own. The sidewalks of Boulder, Lodo, Larimer Square. That's where you'll find her and a captive audience. I drag my parents out like every weekend and when they come home from work, I just have my stuff all ready and I just go play. <laughs> I just love seeing smiles on people's faces and I just love making them happy with my music. And lately, she's been making even more people happy. There is a house. Earlier this year, she played the Apollo Theater in New York City and won first place in the Stars of Tomorrow contest. It was for a sold out crowd and this was the first time she played there. And I said, do you realize that there's gonna be about 1500 people there? And she said, the more the better. <laughs> because you're away, I love the, the glare of the crowd, the glow of cell phones capturing her every note. Those things have never been a problem for Emilise. I, I love listening to her. I'm a little biased because she's my daughter, but I love watching other people react to her anything that comes out of her mouth. You know, she's my little girl, but uh, but watching other people uh, and how they respond to her, I see that people really enjoy what she does. She's already had a few paid gigs and one day soon, she hopes sidewalks and street corners are not the only crowded venues where couples can dance to songs older than the singer. I would really like to play at the Hollywood Bowl at Red Rocks. I would love to play at the Grand Ole Opry <laughs> to a sold out crowd there too. I just keep the wheels rolling. And if history is any indicator, she'll do it, probably before she ever even becomes a teenager. I just want to share my music with the world.
you guys think? I really liked this because I'm just a sucker for a good like human interest story. Um, I also had a question for you. Did you like plan to walk around Boulder and just see what was happening or was this interview scheduled or I mean was the story scheduled? I found that little girl on my way to boss uh, Rockies baseball game. Um, you know, and I saw her and I heard her voice and I was like, who's this? You know, so I talked to her dad and it was like, where does she play? And, you know, I've been trying to do it for a while. Finally, I got to a point where I was like, okay, I got to do something else other than investigative to, to kind of just get me rejuvenated. And so I did that on my weekend. I didn't get paid for that story. Um, you know, and that, and that was fine with me. You know, I did that because I wanted to, it helped me out you know it helped me tell her story you know i think that little girl's gonna be a star <laughs> you know i don't think my story did her justice i mean her voice is incredible you know at her age so sometimes you got to do that stuff you know and I, you know i don't recommend it try to get paid for everything you do but sometimes you got to sacrifice little things like that to make yourself happy anybody else Hey, Gene, I don't know how much time we got. What time do we got till? Uh... We, uh, we, we, uh, it's 11.23, so uh, we uh, have till 11.30, but, you know, if we go over a couple of minutes, that's great, but please, uh, you know, uh, you, all the rest of the time is yours, so if you, uh, I know you said you wanted to kind of share a, share a story about your career, so if you think that's appropriate now, then please feel free, free to share Definitely. Um, you know, just a little bit about me. I... I was born and raised in Roswell, New Mexico. How many of you guys know of Roswell? <laughs> um, I grew up poor. I'm a first generation uh, Mexican American. My parents both have, you know, second grade and sixth grade educations. I didn't go to college. Um, I grew up in one of the toughest cities in New Mexico, you know, where it had a higher murder rate than than a, a city uh, three times the size. So it was it was a struggle to get to this point. And how I made it was just by passion. I kind of just fell into it. Um, I started off working mass control, which was pressing two buttons. I had no idea um, what I was doing or what TV was, you know, but for some reason I was able to just keep going, you know, and that brought me to Denver. Um, to where my dreams have gone so far, you know, throughout my career. You know, I've won over 30 plus awards, you know, 12 plus, you know, I think it's about 12 national awards in the past seven years, um, which is not easy to do in this market or in your career. I've worked with guys who have never won awards, but awards are not is not why I do this. Um, I do this because I want to make an impact. I want to make a difference in people's lives. I want to give them a voice. Um, and so the last story I was going to show you guys was something that we were nominated for DuPont um, here uh, this past year. But it was, a, it was before this whole Black Lives Matter movement. It was before everything. I'm just going to show you the intro to it because it's pretty long. But the DuPont... Uh, you guys will know is like the Pulitzer Prize in TV broadcasting. It's the highest award you could get. We didn't win, but um, just to be nominated was pretty cool. So I'll show you the intro and then I'll open it up for any questions you guys have. Is that okay, Gene? That's great. Yeah. Stop right there. Hey, stop right there. If he had him wear that mask, I think he could have left. Yeah. I'm going home. Relax, or I'm going to have to change this situation. Is it a crime to run down the street wearing a ski mask? Again, it's suspicious circumstances. Is it a crime? It is suspicious circumstances. So I want everybody to pay for this because it's the great cover up of Colorado right now. The 
just like breaks my heart. He knew he was gonna die. He knew he was gonna die. I could hear it in his voice. This is a Fox 31 News special. The problem solvers. So backstory on this is that we had been doing this story um, probably a year before the George Floyd. We had been following this kid. Nobody else in this market cared about him. And we had been just doing a series of stories on him, you know, and, and this is why I'm a journalist, you know, to give a person like that a voice. So any questions? Hold on, let me draw my tears. Oh, well, you go ahead first. No, you, you go, Hannah, you're good. Seriously, <laughs> go for it. Um, those stories are always really hard to watch, but, you know, need to be done. How do you approach like, grieving families without coming across pushy? You have to be human, um, honestly. You have to uh, just understand anybody you're interviewing, just put yourself in their shoes. Think about um, what they're going through and just be respectful. I can't tell you how many reporters I've, I've worked with where um, they just care about the story and I don't. I think I think you could get you can be human even as a journalist, you know. But um, just understand that it's, it's not going to be easy. I, I always say that's the toughest part of my job, and that's the, the part I hate the most about my job is sticking a camera in front in front of a grieving mom's face. But in this case, you know, this grieving mom, we gave her a platform. We gave her a voice to tell her son's story that nobody would listen to. You know, so that's what makes it okay. Just be human, you know, just remember, you know, just, just they're human beings, you're a human being, have a heart. Um, so that's awesome information. And like, I totally, that's one thing that I feel like is so hard, you know, when you're gathering information, you have the difficult people, but then you have the difficult circumstances. Um, one thing, I guess, this is like a general question, um, when you capture a sequence, um, do you have like a mental note or like a mental like guideline of what you're looking to capture? That's kind of like a universal thing for all of these stories that you've shown us. Um, well, you have it, you have to anticipate, and that's yeah. something that takes time. You have to think ahead um, while you're doing it. So that's why I'm saying I, I would get to the point where I'm at a restaurant with my family or my girlfriend, and just be like. I'll be watching her listener, but I'll be watching every movement and start anticipating that. And then you just start, it just starts clicking. Um, you start seeing the world in a different, in a different way. So it just takes time. Totally. Awesome. I'm with photo. It's so different than video too, but like, there's still like, as far as like capturing things goes, cause you're, you have motion and the photo is like still, so like, and it's so funny that you like anticipation is like the universal thing for sure between the two that really connects, like we'll be shooting football. And then I'm like, Oh, they're heading towards the end zone. I'm like, let's see what next move, where do we need to be? Let's look at these motions, but that's awesome. And that's something I highlighted. I was like, anticipate, <laughs> anticipate. That's, I think that's a really good keyword for this whole entire um chat honestly so yeah. thank you definitely you got to anticipate you got to be ahead of this uh, you know like two steps ahead of everything that's going to happen to be able to capture those moments awesome thank you yeah. anybody else all right gene thank you so much for having me i appreciate it guys yeah. You need to realize how rare this is and how really generous this is of Isaiah. Um, he's an incredible professional with an unparalleled career and, and, and achievements. And you being willing to open up and share your, your story too is incredibly powerful, Isaiah. I really appreciate your generosity and authenticity and, and transparency because young journalists like this need to hear you know, not only the good stuff and the excitement and the, and, and the bounty that this career can bring to you, but, you know, a, a recognition of the challenges that you're going to face, you know, uh, on the stories that you, you uh, go after, um, your own internal struggles, 
to realize that you know you, you're not you're not a superhuman. You have to take care of yourself, and you know that story about you taking care of your team too. Incredibly powerful stuff. So um, very very generous of you. Thank you so much for being with us today and, and sharing that. Thanks for having me, guys. I'll tell you, you're the first people I've told that story to, all these stories, so <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, if you wanna give me back control, Isaiah, I'm gonna, I share a weekly reading. Uh, and so you you might uh, have heard of this book already or, or appreciate this book, but. Um, I, oh, there you go. I think you have it now. Okay. Yeah, there we go. So I'll, first I'm going to share this site. This is the, the website of the NPPA, nppa.org, National Press Photographers Association. It's what I referenced, what Isaiah referenced. And, you know, Isaiah uh, had the tagline, the, the yearly video uh, workshop uh, in Oklahoma City is uh, the tagline for that workshop is give us a week and we'll change your life. And I, I concur with Isaiah. I went to the workshop and it was, it, my mind was blown. And I filled a notebook full of ideas and tips up and I went back to my station. And for two years, I worked all of those tips and ideas out of that notebook until I could go back to the workshop again. Um, and the contacts I made and the, the, the technique and the, and the insight and the camaraderie I formed with men and women in, in our in visual journalism across the country has really inspired my entire career. So if you don't know about NPPA and you're not a member, especially as a student, it's not, not expensive to join and you should join and take advantage of all of the opportunities that and the training and the resources that NPPA uh, has to offer. Uh, so uh, I recommend that wholeheartedly. Uh, the other thing that uh, I wanna share with you guys is uh, this week's uh, recommended reading. And it's uh, a book, it's more of a book for filmmakers. It's called Shot by Shot, and it's not a new book. Um, and uh, you know what we just did with Isaiah and looking at stories in real time, the video of stories is probably the most instructive way uh, that you can learn about telling stories. But this book was, I bought it early in, in my career. And uh, it's, it's one of the best constructed books in terms of being able to break down visual language, the language of visuals and explain them and provide um, uh, examples, you know, ex the exact composition of shots to help you understand those concepts and how they work because visual storytelling has a language all its own. And this particular book is a fantastic resource for you to be able to, you know, sit there and like stare at the framing of a shot and realize how it's constructed and what kind of message it delivers. And uh, I constantly refer to my copy um, over and over again over the years to uh, help me understand, um, you know, various uh, 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 shots and how they work. So uh, I, this is my recommended uh, reading for the week. Uh, any final questions for Isaiah or Isaiah, any closing thoughts before uh, we let you go? We do have a, a little bit of housekeeping. You're welcome to stay around for that, but I want to be respectful of your time. I appreciate it. Anybody have anything for me? It, I appreciate you guys listening to me and watching my stories. If you guys ever need anything, um, reach out to me. Um, you have my LinkedIn info there. If you just want to send me a message, if you ever want me just to uh, look at a story you've done or, or need some advice, you know, just hit me up on there. Great. Thanks so much. Isaiah, be blessed, my friend. We'll see Thanks you again. Thank you. We'll see you soon, Thank okay? Thank you so much.